Well, Nourishing Love, this book, came to me during the, uh, the whole time of COVID. I was, uh, at the time, I was in my hermitage in Florida, which I usually go to every year for two months to three while I'm working on a writing project. And um, while I was here, all of that hit. And uh, so I, I, I was kind of caught. I stayed and I was here and have been here for a year, but I will be going home now. But during that time, uh, this book just kind of came to me. Uh, and I, I, I even had made a little shrine to Mary down here. And that was probably, I don't know why I did that, but I just had this uh, need to somehow uh, focus on Mary. I don't know, it could have been the womb-like feeling of being in a hermitage or whatever. But what came to me was that I, I hadn't for a long time seen a Franciscan book about Mary. And I said, well, what could I do? Could I do anything about that? So what, what came to me then was uh, that I should uh, talk about Mary in terms of Franciscan meditation and also model that what a Franciscan meditation feels like and is. And then being a poet, I said, I, I could check on my poems. And I was surprised going back to the time I was 15 years old that I had written two poems about Mary and uh, over the years, so I gathered them together. So you have these meditations and then you have these poems and then I I said uh, uh, I want to do some like reflections or essays different aspects and the first one would be um, briefly a summary of who Mary is in Franciscan and Catholic theology and then my own experience of Mary uh, and which has been varied over the years. And I, I had had an experience just a few years ago when I was 80, 80 years old in Loreto in Italy that was the kind of experience that I prayed for, you know, for the, my whole youth and nothing ever happened except I got more anxious. <laughs> so, it showed me that, you know, when when uh, something comes, it comes. You can't merit it or or, or or make or make sure it's going to happen or whatever. So that's what became kind of the structure of the book. And these Franciscans' meditations at the beginning, you know, Francis, Saint Francis. Well, in some regard, Pope Francis too, but Saint Francis. Uh, was really a dramatist, you know, he, he kind of enacted, he enacted mystery. Whenever there was some mystery, he figured out some way that he could make people be involved in it. As it, Greccio in 1223, three years before he died, he enacts a live Christmas crib at mass so the people would be in a little drama. So the what developed out of that practice of Francis is we knew that that came out of his contemplation, out of his deep prayer. And Francis would pray that way. He would put himself in some event in the Bible. He would become the donkey, say, at the, at the Christmas crib or he would become Mary uh, beneath the cross or John beneath the cross. Um, so, and then he would just enter into that and 
see whatever spiritual energy emerged from that. And the Franciscan scholar Ewart Cousins, a great scholar on St. Bonaventure and who did several books of Bonaventure for the classics of Western uh, spirituality, rest, uh, mysticism, Western mysticism. He called that the mysticism of the historical event. You enter into it, you pray in it, and then there will be some kind of spiritual energy that will come from that that tells you what you're to do today, how you are to live this day. It's very much like going on a pilgrimage to a, a shrine to, to St. Francis's tomb and his brothers, four of his brothers are buried right around him and you would start praying, you will become one of the brothers, Brother Marseille, I'll say. And then, you, what are you feeling? Francis is dead, you're looking at his t tomb, you know, what does that mean? That, so that's very much, St. Ignatius of Loyola was very taken with that a couple centuries later and made it a part of his spiritual exercises. So, uh, uh, I didn't intend this from the beginning, but when it began to happen, and I saw what was happening when I well, started entering into prayer about the final years of Mary living with John, John the Beloved, John the Evangelist, in Ephesus, and so I realized that I should just go with this and, uh, uh, and see where it goes. And so that becomes the first part of the book. And so as I was writing, and, and, and especially when I finished that section, I said to myself, self, <laughs> I said, this is a book not to be read, it's a book to be prayed. You have a whole year. After a while, I knew it was gonna be a year at discussing it with the friars and everything. And so I said, so take your time because it is not a book to be dashed through. It's like a poem. People will read it, pray with it, think of their own scenarios or whatever. And so that's how that first section came. Then I had the poems that I was writing. Uh, and then I, I knew I wanted to say, where are we with Mary in the church today? So I, I have quite a few essay-like uh, reflections at the end of the book that will locate Mary uh, out of what might just be the sentimental or might be what, how does she fit in or who is she in some people's minds. I thought that I needed to clarify that, not only for them, but for me. I was, I was clarifying things for me. I, I've learned over a long <laughs> lifetime of writing that if I can, if I can understand it, it's finally there. And it's amazing how often I'll write something and then I look at it a month later and I'll say, what in the world were you talking about? What is this? What is this? And I realize that it's not clear that I have to go back to it. Well, by the grace of God and the intercession of Mary, I, I, I was able to have the time to do that, to take my time. And, uh, and so that's how the book came to be.